Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the September regular meeting of the Wimberley ISD Board of Trustees. I'd ask that uh, we be able to start the meeting. Um, looking around, we do, in fact, have a quorum of board members. We have one joining us via video conference, Will Connolly. This time, I'd like to make sure Will's connected. Yes, Joe, can you hear me? Will you out there? Yes, can you hear me? Joe, can you hear me? Hello? 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 Will, are you connected with us? Yes, you can see me, right? And we can hear you. Great. Okay. Great. Okay, so we have a quorum, and at this time, I'd ask that we all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. Liberty and for all. Please remain standing for a moment of silent prayer and reflection. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, at this time, I'd like to read our vision statement, which is empowering and inspiring all students to achieve their full potential. The mission statement of Wimberley ISD is, Wimberley ISD is dedicated to excellence in education that fosters a culture of kindness and respect, creates lifelong learners and empowers students to make a positive impact in their community. We believe that everything that we do should help ensure the success of all of our students. As educators, we maximize the class time in an engaging and challenging way. Our teachers are personally invested in our students. Students in Wimberley are committed to community service and the community supports students in return. Quality public Wimberley ISD education drives the future of a successful Texas. As a district, we strive to meet the needs of the whole child academically, emotionally, and socially. Wimberley ISD provides a foundation to create engaged citizens who will become lifelong learners. All of our children, parents, faculty, and staff should be treated with kindness and respect. We are committed to excellence in all we do. The Wimberley ISD goals, achieve excellence in education, foster a culture of kindness and respect, create lifelong learners, make a positive community impact. At this time, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. York here to recognize Tracy Phillips, who's with us tonight. So you better know Tracy as Tracy Maxwell Phillips. And so um, I cannot say enough about what we've been through, I mean, you know, uh, but she was elected in uh, on January 27th, 2015, and she resigned on June 30th, 2021, because she got married. That's a good excuse to resign a uh, school board, probably, you think? You moved, that's right, that's right. Anyway, I've got two pages of things that I can say about Tracy. And she told me to highlight them. So she served as board vice president for three years, Hayes County Appraisal Board, very difficult role for four and a half years. She had six years of budget and tax approval, six years campus improvement plans, six years district calendar, financial audits, student handbook, code of conduct, uh, extension of administrative contracts, WHS and uh, Danforth course books, 
um, my evaluation, <laughs> team building, and participated in strategic planning and policy updates from 102 to 116, which is very important. One of the things that Tracy did do that is has not been acknowledged over the course of several years is that in 2008, 2009, we were faced with literally district insolvency because of the situation that we were in. We were $2.7 million deficit. Um, we had 1.5 million that we owed in Robinhood recapture payments. And so Tracy literally was at the Capitol Oh, I, I don't know how many times um, because they used to grab me and want to make sure that the crazy lady from Wembley was not with me. Now they, you, that's not what they called her, but <laughs> that's what I'm saying tonight. And, and so um, we really did fought, we fought hard for the mid-sized school adjustment. And the next thing you know, the following year, we received $1.2 million in mid-sized school adjustment for Robin Hood. And so that is what helped us turn this insolvency issue around. I think in 2010, we ended up with $207,000. That was it in fund balance. And today we have close to 9 million. And so that was a huge accomplishment. Um, she's been involved with the, the Blue Hole primary, that, that land acquisition, uh, random drug testing policies, Anti-Defamation uh, League, uh, voted on that, District of Innovation. Um, we were faced with the governor was not willing to fund uh, pre-K. And so we decided as a district, that we were gonna start this venture with funding full day pre-K for all kids, whether you qualified or not. So that we're going on year five of funding that program completely. And then all the bonds, oh my gosh, we had, let me turn the page here. <laughs> We had four bond elections and it was for 100 plus million dollars of, of bonds. And so someone asked me, do we have a before and after picture, a 2007 photo of the district versus um, 2020, 2021? I don't know that we do. Uh, but I hope that you people that have been here for a while can see all the different facilities and all the different um, bond projects that we've done. And programming, yes, our CTE programming, um, that was, that's huge and it is exploding as we speak. Our pre-K is now our tuition-based pre-K has gone as low as three and four-year-olds and, and what? Nine classes, nine sections. When we started this program, we had one section and it was a little large, so we added an aid. And now we're at nine full sections with teachers and aides. So all of this academic, um, you know, process, uh, uh, progress that we've made over the years, uh, a lot of this had to do with Tracy. And so Tracy, on behalf of me and the school board, I cannot thank you enough for all of this, but we're not done yet because Jason Valentine is fixing to come up here. All right, no disrespect, Mr. York, but you went through a lot of the uh, boring stuff, if you will. I want, I want to talk about some of the fun stuff. <laughs> Uh, and, and mainly speaking to the impact that she had on the high school campus itself uh, with the Spirit of Texas bike ride for a band fundraiser, uh, instrumental uh, in the construction of the field house and the band concession stand and making sure that those students were uniformed. 
um, academic booster club, teachers luncheons, scholarship committee, uh, started the program generation, paved the way for uh, first generation college students. Would take those students with her to TSTC in Waco uh, and help get them started with some uh, post high school endeavors, which is awesome. Senior outreach uh, was a, an offshoot of the senior program in which they would out, get out and be involved in the community and worked a lot with Miss Van Hoosier and Miss Maxwell Phillips. Um, let's see, uh, volleyball concessions, sex fest, team mom, project graduations by the many. Uh, 2015 flood, the Bridges Gym coordinator that uh, turned Bridges Gym into basically uh, what looked like a warehouse for Walmart uh, at one point in time or another. Uh, the baccalaureate liaison to help the students out of senior outreach organize baccalaureate for our senior class each year. And uh, the last thing that I had on this list was the college fair organizer. She's the one that brought the college fair to the high school. Uh, it continues and uh, uh, that's all part of the legacy that Tracy had brought to the high school. And the high school just wanted to uh, provide you with something, a token of appreciation. Okay. <laughs> Wh whichever order you want it, Mr. York. Um, oh my gosh, I got to read this with sincere appreciation for your dedication, your dedicated service to the children of Wembley as a member of the Wembley Independent School District Board of Trustees, February 2015, June 2021. Congratulations. We cannot thank you enough. And here is your name plate. And so now Jason has probably something that you would prefer anyway. So since, since um, leaving Wembley Texans, we're not going to be able to take the Wembley Texans out of you, though, and we wanted those boots to go along with you and, and uh, your new adventures, and I know that you're not saying goodbye, you're just saying uh, talk to you later, and uh, we'll go from there, but thank you for everything that you've done for us. I, prom I promise I will make this very quick. Um, Yes, as Jason said, you will never take the Texan pride out of me. Um, I will be a Texan for life, and I am not gone completely. I just have uh, changed my address um, where I reside in the evenings, pretty much. I'm here every week, um, and I'm forever grateful for my time on the board here. It was awesome, um, and my time at the high school, as y'all can tell, is very near and dear to my heart and the number of kids that we've seen through to go to their next step um, in this town and this school district means tons to me. Thank you guys. Thank you, Tracy. On behalf of the board, we want to thank you for your dedicated service to the district and uh, a great legacy that you've left behind. You've left the school in a better place, and we appreciate that. And we wish you well. Stay in touch, and uh, you get to you get, you get to leave now. Leave now, so like you. Congratulations. <laughs> I 
Okay, well, that's a real positive way to start off the evening. Um, at this time, uh, we, we'd like to move down to our public forum. Uh, I have to read some kind of re required disclosure here. Before, before I do that, I just want to um, remind everybody that we've gotten several people that like to, would like to speak tonight. So we're going to limit the comments to three minutes. Um, after three minutes, you'll hear a chime. It will go off. Uh, I'll try to you know, just politely interrupt you and ask you to wrap up. Uh, please don't take offense. We do this just to kind of keep the meeting moving. And uh, we do have a lot of school business we have to accomplish tonight as well. Uh, so we welcome everybody up to make their comment. And then after three minutes, uh, you know, we just ask that you wrap things up. Uh, with that said, uh, let me read this. Uh, I will remind the audience of the Board of Trustees public comment rules. Persons who wish to present public comment must sign in prior to the meeting, start on the day of the meeting, and list his or her name, name of the group that he or she represents, and the agenda item. Each speaker's submitted comments will be allotted three minutes for presentation to the board, with six minutes granted to a person with a translator. A group of five persons or more shall appoint one speaker who will be allowed three minutes for public comments. The same rules will be observed for public comments on non-agenda items with the following exceptions. Public comments on non-agenda items will only be scheduled for regular meetings of the board and the total time that will be allowed on non-public comments will be 30 minutes. Please keep your comments or criticisms civil and courteous. Please also avoid using profanity and refrain from making personal attacks on others. Except for the speaker's student, no other student's name or identity should be discussed. If you have a concern that you would like heard and resolved, please present your concern through the district's grievance policies. Grievance forms can be obtained at the central office or on the district's website. Trustees are not permitted by law to respond or discuss public comments. However, the board president may direct a speaker to the appropriate administrator for further discussion. This time I will welcome Danny German up, please. My daughter was supposed to go first. Oh, well. My name is Danny German. And like many of you, I've been adversely affected by COVID and continue to endure a lingering COVID issue but I've been more, uh, far more negatively affected by the myriad of government mandates, which include closure of businesses unless employing essential workers, mask wearing, how close we can stand to each other, the size of our gatherings, the closures of our churches, and now some school districts are mandating vaccination. These mandates come with so many unintended consequences that take a far greater toll than the disease itself, including a massive economic depression leading to millions of layoffs and tens of thousands of business closures. Government funding the unemployment of tens of millions, thus incentivizing too many to stay unemployed, leading to 70% of all business operating with a, with a staff shortage. And now as a small business owner, I've been mandated to force our employees to get the vaccine. And what if they say, no, I have to fire them. And what if they're essential workers? A year ago, they, they were necessary to keeping social order, but now are they expendable? So I fire them because I've been threatened with a hefty fine. Then what? I open myself up to a wrongful termination lawsuit while the former employee is able to easily collect unemployment and I'm stuck with a vacant position that is currently so difficult to fill. I'll tie this back to WISD. We all know the healthy revenue surplus the district has enjoyed because, uh, because of spike in enrollment. We know the positive effect this has on teachers' pay and the acquisition of future assets to help maintain the quality of education. That's the Wimberley way. That's why my family moved here. The enrollment increase is the result of a migration of many families willing to uproot their lives and search for government institutions that allow them to make choices that are best for their families and not be weighed down under the heavy hand of Big Brother, who is intent on mandates and force because, quote, their patience is running thin. They've moved here because they see the wisdom and the fortitude this board has shown, and they put faith in this board to uphold those wise decisions, which allow their family to make decisions that are best for their health needs. Board, 
I ask you not to reverse course and decide to re-implement a mask mandate or heaven forbid mandate student vaccination. If this happened, the goodwill your decisions have engendered would result in yet another unintended consequence, the mass exodus of so many students. Besides, what does the majority really want? Take a look around any school, most maskless, or do a quick 360 at a Friday night football game, 80 to 90% maskless. The choice should remain with each family or else sad consequences will follow because we're tired of being beaten into submission with mandate upon mandate and we will no, no, we will no longer tolerate the beating. Thank you. Okay, next up, Riley German. Um, as a junior at Wimberley High School, I want to walk you through my day at school. If I'm just going off of what I see, I would say when I first get there, there is probably about 20 people wearing a mask properly. Then when we go to lunch, we're not a single person social distances or wear a mask. By the end of the day, I would say about half of those kids originally wearing a mask now have it on their chin. Then even the kids that wear it all day take it off for athletics. Today we had 54 people in the weight room at one time. We are sweating and breathing heavily on each other. And if you've been in there, it's pretty small. Now let's say after this, you have a game. Well, now you're on a bus where you usually sit two to a seat. No one wears a mask on a bus. And if they are, I haven't seen it. I'm not trying to get more restrictions. I want the restrictions to stop. I understand that COVID is real and some people are getting sick from it. I got COVID last year when everyone was forced to mask up, but I didn't even know I had it until I lost my taste and smell. However, I have been hospitalized before with pneumonia and a common, from a common cold and had to do breathing treatments for years. It was miserable, but there are risks for everything we do in life. However, we have masked up or mandated, we have never masked up or mandated vaccines for a common cold or flu. We are taught in school to use our brains and to think for ourselves. So if all day you say wearing a mask will help us, but then we go to activities and no one wears it, how is it helping? We see these inconsistencies everywhere in our government and in our everyday life. For example, why in a restaurant am I only contagious when getting to my seat, but when I sit down, I'm not contagious anymore. Now to pep rally, <laughs> now pep rallies have been moved outside instead of in the gym and everyone hated it. I don't understand why we are moving an event outside to protect the people that are scared when they had already been in class with these same people all day long. This year, no one is forced to go to a pep rally and they can just stay in their classroom. You are taking the small few that want more restrictions and changing it for everyone. Homecoming on the field makes no sense either. People are still going to dance with each other as well as mosh. If you don't feel comfortable, you don't have to come, but we don't want it on the field either. If I use my brain to think about the situation, it becomes clear that the inconsistency of certain rules or possible mandates is ridiculous because what do you think happens and will continue to happen if you give us a mask mandate? The second school gets out, we'll all still climb into one car with our friends and go to their house. We wanna be kids. Adults our whole lives tell us that high school is some of the greatest years of our lives and I have yet to have one normal year of high school. Please end all the restrictions and let us choose how to be healthy for ourselves. I learned in history this week that one Washington, George Washington's cousin once said, liberty is sweet. So why now are we taking our liberty away when our ancestors fought so hard for us to get it in the first place over a virus that has over a 99% survival rate? Thank you. Next up, Tucker Furlow. I'm not sure how I pulled the card to go after the Germans, but uh, I'll just reiterate what they've said thus far. But to introduce myself, my name is Tucker Furlow and I'm a resident of Wimberley. Um, I grew up here, going here from kindergarten through high school. I have two boys, they are 11 and eight and they are also in the school district here. I wanna start by thanking all of you. Y'all are facing some pretty difficult times, clearly, on both sides. So I want to lift you all up and say that, and encourage y'all. Say, keep going. You're making bold decisions in the face of adversity, and we see it, and we appreciate it. I want to give a little background. Uh, I've had the opportunity to practice law here in the state for the past 14 years. 
The most rewarding part of that practice was four years. I got to represent state-supported living centers here in Texas. In that vein, I represented hundreds of situations of abuse, neglect, and exploitation of individuals in those facilities. During that time, I saw some very awful and horrible things. But I want you to hear me clearly. There were a lot of differences in those situations that we faced, from doctors who disagreed with each other, from nurses who disagreed with each other, um, from attorneys who disagreed with each other when they were all trying for one thing, and that was trying to give everyone what is the best health and safety for those individuals here at those state supported living centers. Now, I want to segue and say that God blessed me. He blessed me very much with two boys, and that's the best thing in my life. Now, with that blessing comes a major responsibility, just like every parent in here, and that's to provide the best care that I can. And I'll tell you what, I spend thousands of hours of my life doing what I can to make tough decisions for their health and for their safety. We all do. And I, I raise my boys. I'm like, you know what? There's going to be differences that you're going to face in different situations. However, I want you to respect and I want you to love all of those people and all of those different situations they're going to face. And I stand before you to say for the furlough boys and for the furlough family, I want uh, to have our family choose what's best for their health and safety. And if some other family wants to choose differently, great. If family B, C wants to choose to mask their children, great. Mask your children for their health and safety. We support that decision. My family does. If you don't want to mask them, don't. If you want to vaccinate your child, vaccinate them. We support that. If you don't, don't. But God blessed my, me with making those decisions for my family. And I'm thankful for that. And I appreciate it. So I want to end again by just saying thank you so much. I appreciate it. And let our families have the choice. Next up, we have Sarah Guerra. I don't know how to do that. Sorry. I can talk loud though. I'm Sarah Guerrero. I have four daughters in the district and I just wanna say thank you all for your service. I know this is really hard and, and um, it makes me really sad, honestly, because at the end of the day, all of us just want what's best for our kids. And we've forgotten that a little bit, but. I personally think that it should be a personal choice. Nobody knows my babies like I do. Um, we've had, um, we have a child that's suffering from severe anxiety and we're finally starting to see the other side of that. Um, and these little joys about being a kid, pep rallies, games, we're finally able to do those things. And when there's this pushback to take those away, where's the joy? I mean, childhood is over in a second. And it should be my choice. If I don't want my kids being exposed to pep rallies or games, then I can choose to keep them home. But no one else should choose for me what my children can do. So I just ask that you continue to stay the course. You continue to let us as parents parent. Um, I, I wouldn't want that responsibility to parent other all y'all's kids. So please don't try to parent mine. So I appreciate y'all. Um, and I appreciate the teachers. So much of this has been, become a distraction from just education. We're so worried about all this other junk and our kids are not getting English and math and all this because we're worried about being right. So I just thank you again and just please continue to let us just choose for our babies. Next up, Ty Ford. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ty Ford. I'm here representing my family of four. Uh, we've got two young boys, age 10 and six, here in the Wimberley community. Uh, we moved in in summer of 2019 after we found what we thought was something extremely special that existed here in Texas. As native Texans, my wife and I have grown up in a number of communities and spent some time in a number of areas in the state. Um, but we knew we wanted to be here. We want to raise our family here, but quickly found ourselves having to fight battles on a different front very quickly. Constitutional rights of ours were being impacted by decisions that were being made for a variety of reasons. Completely understand the fact that we were faced with some challenges that no one had ever navigated, um, but we quickly saw the need to get involved. And we, we got involved and continue to be involved with regards to what we choose to support. And that what we choose to support is the right to choose what's best for our children and parents' choice to continue to do and make decisions on what we feel is in their best interest, as we do with every other parent or guardian in the room with kids in the school district. Unfortunately, this political battlefield has seemed to have taken root here in the education system. 
And it's a field of activism with a number of different things that continue to impact your decisions that you're making as a school board, having you rely on your constituents to provide you feedback on how they feel that you should vote regarding certain things. But as you see, and you look at the vision statement in terms of what we're trying to do within our school district and what we're trying to represent as a community, we've lost our path, okay? We don't need to be listening to all the different opinions and perspectives of how individuals feel that they should you know, vote on certain issues, but you've all taken oaths associated with what you believe is in the best interest and the vision of we want our community to be. So although we're new to this community, we're shifting our focus, not just to our kids extenuating through junior high and high school, but we want a community where they can come back and raise their children and they raise their children from here on out. But if we don't unite as a community and we don't see ourselves as being truly Wimberley strong, this is not the community that is going to foster that type of environment, not but for my kids or for any of the one's children. And that should be what we're focused on as a community. So I thank you guys certainly for what you're having to do day in and day out, the challenges that you're having to navigate on behalf of my family and other families, and certainly wish you the best and know that we'll continue to support you to allow us to make the decisions what's right for our families. Thank you. Next up, Paul Guerrero. My name is Paul Guerrero. I have four daughters in Wembley ISD. Um, my oldest is an athlete, and her name is Sophie Guerrero. She's an amazing little girl. Last year, as a seventh grader, she struggled with, with her face, and we had to see a dermatologist because of her face, because she's an athlete, because she was covered up through volleyball tournaments, through basketball tournaments, and through track. Um, this year, her face is cleared up, and she's never been happier. She's never been more confident she's ever been in, in her life. Um, my other three girls had to go through psycho had to see a psychiatrist. One of them had to see a psychiatrist. And she's never been happier than she is right now because she's able to live her life happy, um, live her life with her friends, and, and live some semi-normal life. So I don't envy the position you guys have been put into, but I appreciate you making these decisions for our kids. And I understand you're doing what's best, what you feel is best for our kids, but I appreciate you allow allowing me to make medical decisions for my children. So thank you so much for what you do, and uh, I appreciate everything you've done for us. Thank you so much. Next up, Michael Congdon. Good evening. Uh, my name is Michael Congdon and I have a seventh grader who uh, just transferred into Danforth from a private school. Uh, I'm here to ask the board just to implement a mask mandate for two months. Um, my approach to handling major risks and critical issues like this pandemic is to gather and analyze as much relevant data as possible and I evaluate my options, assess the risk, and make the best decision. What I've learned from this pandemic is that my approach to this logic and reason is not widely practiced. So I'm not here today to report on statistics and research and science, uh, as this seems to have proven futile in persuading our community at large. Though I'm a little disappointed in my community in this regard, I still believe we are all firmly dedicated to protecting our fellow Americans from all these threats, foreign and domestic. So I'm here to ask for your help. Please help me protect my child and my family. My family is here to do the same for you. We're here to protect your child from predators and other dangers. Pre-pandemic, we love to throw big parties and encourage our kids to invite everyone from school to celebrate everyone, not just their close circle of friends. When it's safer, we plan to do our big Easter egg hunts and our Christmas time uh, gingerbread house making contests and our Buddy the Elf belching contests and spaghetti eating contests but let's reciprocate this appreciation of each other's children. Uh, just last week, I was behind a lady on Ranch Road 12 whose car had just broke down. I pulled over to help and saw she seemed pretty distressed. Apparently she had two elementary school students waiting for her at a bus stop and another child waiting by the Dollar General uh, out in our Texas heat. So we hightailed it to my place, got a bigger van, scurried over and picked up all her kids. As it turns out, uh, one of them is a boy on the Danforth football team who's in my daughter's class. So I thought that was a pretty cool coincidence. Though I could tell their family had a different viewpoint on this pandemic, I never hesitated to help them in their time of need. And now my daughter has a new friend in her life. This is what a community does to help each other out. And this is what I'm asking of the parents and the school board. Refusing this will only create a more permanent rift of distrust between us and I don't want to waste my time in one-sided relationships, as I'm sure we all don't. 
Now that the Pfizer uh, vaccine will be submitted for FDA emergency approval for kids five and up, the parents who are advocating for masks are most likely going to vaccinate their children, and this mask mandate will no longer be an issue. Uh, I consider masks to be a minor, temporary sacrifice of comfort for the greater good. Our kids are mandated to wear closed-toed shoes in school, but there's no community uproar there. Uh, we all vaccinated and immunized our own children as a prerequisite for attendance. In fact, the first weekend of school, I got a voicemail that my daughter was missing two low-risk immunizations, and Mr. Howard would remove her from class the next day if she did not get them. Again, no uproar there. I humbly and graciously ask you to help protect my child with just a two-month mask mandate. Thank you for your time. Next up, Jeff Harper. Hi, I'm Dr. Jeff Harper. I have been in this community for 10 years. I have uh, had two children pass through the school district, have one currently, it's a senior. And uh, I am 30 hours from having three degrees. And when I tell you that I research, believe me when I say I'm thorough, okay? I have uh, researched the mask mandates, the vaccines till I'm blue in the face. And masks are fomites. So if you don't wanna know what a fomite is, look it up. Okay, so you have a Petri dish on your, your child's face. People cannot stop touching them. And it is ridiculous to mandate it. And I appreciate the fact that you guys have um, stuck with our freedoms and allowed us to do that, to let us choose what we do with our family. Um, as, as I, I cannot believe that I'm hearing people say that they're gonna vaccinate their children. That is ludicrous. And I can, I've lost eight patients to this vaccine. I've never lost a single patient before to any vaccine until this one came around. Eight patients in eight months. So I'm shaking right now because I'm angry and I'm hurt because I have lost eight people that I dearly care about from a direct correlation to the shot. If you look on the VAERS website, the CDC website, there are 15,000 deaths that are already associated with this vaccine. So educate yourself. Harvard did a study over the VAERS, vax, the VAERS system and showed that only less than 1% even know about it. Anybody here know about the VAERS? Very few, right? Only 1%. So they use a multiplier of five. So that tells us that there are 75,000 people who have lost their lives to this vaccine. And I personally get emails every single day and see another child with myocarditis die. And it breaks my heart. And I cannot stand to hear people who are so uneducated say that they're gonna do this to their children and say that it's okay and say that it's our lifeline because it isn't, it's actually killing us. And you need to realize that there are, there are tons of references out there. Ivermectin, no matter what the news sells to you is a lifesaver. I have personally seen it over and over again. If you don't have the money to get Ivermectin, you can contact myfreedoctor.com and that is a resource you can give to your friends and your family so that you can get that medicine sooner than uh, later is better. You can also look uh, at Peter McCullough. He is a well-renowned doctor in Texas, board-certified cardiologist, has authored 700 studies. He has been part of 24 different vaccine approvals. And he says to never take this vaccine. And I agree with him and never give it to your children. If you've given it to your children, pray to God. And I don't wanna scare you guys, but you need to be scared because this is serious and people are being injured. So uh, AmericaOutloud.com. Excuse me, sir, I think we've reached three minutes. Okay, thank thank you. you. AmericaOutloud.com, FLCC.org. Look it up and thank you. Next up, Leah Duell. I just wanna say y'all have a really tough job. Uh, I'm Leah Duell. I've been a resident of Wimberley with my husband and three children for 15 years now. Um, I, I come here today 
for just a couple of things. First, I wanna say thank you for your continued support of the freedom to choose whether or not we believe our children should wear a mask in school. On behalf of many of the parents in the district, a lot of them here in the room, I'm requesting for that freedom to remain. <laughs> Going forward, I think we can all see, thank you, Dr. Harper, for bringing factual information about the vaccine. I think we can all see where we're headed in America. I think we can all see where we're headed with our children and the things that are gonna be placed um, perhaps in the school board's hands to make a decision on. And I believe that here pretty soon, vaccine mandates for the COVID-19 vaccine are gonna be coming. Maybe they won't. But I wanna make sure that everybody in the room knows there is a conscientious declination form that you can request from the Department of Health and Human Services. And you can list on there what vaccines you want your children to have and what vaccines you don't want them to have. And it's your choice. And you can go get it notarized and you can hand deliver it and they don't have to have it. My children don't have all the vaccines that are on the list because I made the conscientious decision with my husband that there were some we didn't think were appropriate. And so I just wanna make sure everybody knows that you have the right to do that. It's very important. So going forward in the event that this vaccine is mandated in public schools, I request with the support of a lot of people in this room and not in this room, that you would give us the freedom to choose whether or not we wanna vaccinate our kid in order to participate in public schools that we all pay taxes for. In addition, I have another question for you guys about rule following. And I just wanna ask, when we all set rules at our own houses for our children, do we expect for them to follow the rules we set? I think it's a resounding yes. And so if they don't make sense, I hope my children are old enough now that we've trained them to question us if we give them a rule that doesn't make sense. And so I wanna ask, let me make sure I get the right words here. We have set a rule for our uh, Wimberley Texan logo to remain the way that it is. And I'm just curious, if we aren't following the rule and the precedent that we've set, how do we send our children to school to follow rules that are set that perhaps they don't agree with? Can they question them? Can they just blatantly not follow them? I'm just asking. Um, that's all I have. You guys have a hard job. I appreciate your time. And I thank you for the conversations that we've all had uh, in group settings and here at the school board meeting. Thank you. Next up, Sheila Ray. Um, my name is Sheila Ray. I've lived in Hayes County for 35 years, and I've had three children go through your public school, and I homeschooled for 19 years. Um, I'm very grateful for those of you who um, are standing for freedom, and I know that it is a hard fight. I think that we make it about masks and vaccines, but ultimately, it is about freedom, and in this room, there are soldiers. I feel like a soldier armed um, fighting for what people have shed blood for. And then there's the enemy and the enemy is lies. And so you can present all the data, you can present all the statistics and nobody's gonna listen. They are not after truth. It's really about evil and good. That's what this fight is about. Right now it's about masks, it looks like masks. On the topic of masks, I mean, all of us who have common sense understand that just one of the person people brought up about you go in a restaurant, you got your mask on, you sit down, you can take it off. It's just stupid. And our kids are sick of hearing about it. I'm so sick of talking about it. I'm, I'm emotionally drained and exhausted. I feel like I have PTSD. If you get your news just from CNN, um, no wonder you don't know the truth. You got to go to things like BitChute and Rumble and OAN and um, Highwire to hear degreed people like this. Um, chiropractor right here who held multiple degrees in virology, um, epidemiology, uh, biology, and, and they'll speak a totally different agenda. 
than what you're hearing um, in the news on mainstream media. Right now this week, we have two family members dying who are fully vaccinated and mask religious. And I have a son who went to visit them with his family, not knowing that they had COVID. And once they got to Florida, they found out they had COVID and they left it with them with their masks on and everything. And they are, one died last week and the other one will probably pass away before the end of the week. That is the truth of it. There is so much, like he says, about the vaccine out that you're not getting. My dad's a pharmacist, by the way, ivermectin. And he says the horse paste, if it's just ivermectin, 1.8% and nothing else in it, it's a great cure. So I'm like, I'm going to push that because it's been around for 40 years. So I'm trying to get my thoughts because I could talk all day on this. I could talk, I've listened for thousands of hours because I'm a housewife. I have the time to work and clean and do that. And I listen for thousands of hours to people and I'm passionate that our freedoms, I feel like a tidal wave is coming and all of our children are playing on the beach and I'm running around screaming, do you see what's coming? Do you see what's coming? Do you see what's coming with the vaccine injury that's gonna be coming? Israel is six months ahead of us and they're already seeing the number skyrockets destroying the immune system. I mean, that's a whole nother topic. I came here today as a soldier to just say thank you for those who are fighting. It looks like you're fighting for a mask. It's really good versus evil. Um, it's truth versus lies, ultimate truth. I stand here to defend my love for Jesus, my love for America, my love for freedom, um, my love for my health. And um, I just thank y'all. Thank you for fighting. Don't quit. No matter how tired you get, don't quit. Thank you. Hey, Alan or D. So the audience is having a very tough time hearing. So if you would please remove the mic from the stand when you speak and speak closer. And then if we can turn it up, I think that that would be a good thing. All right, so it's maxed, uh, so we can't turn it up or there'll be tons of feedback. So please remove the mic from the stand and speak into the mic. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Sarah Zizzo. Hi, my name is Sarah Zizzo and I have three children in the district. I understand that the goal of the school is to educate. I cannot begin to imagine the stress of being a teacher or staff during the current state. Last year, we did a great job of mitigating spread of COVID. We've seen double and oftentimes triple the numbers that we've seen last year. We've seen classrooms at other schools completely closed down. When kids miss school, they miss learning and opportunities. How many of you had, have held the hand of a person that died from COVID-19 or seen the one sole visitor in the cafeteria sobbing with no support? I have. Last week, my kid came home. He'd been in school for about a month. 13 out of 22 kids were present in his class. Seven COVID notifications from one class. I've asked my children to mask as much as possible. He says he's about an eight of a 10. He cried himself to sleep three nights last week. Mama, the girl that sits next to me has COVID. Mama, the girl across from me has COVID. She doesn't wear a mask. What if I get sick? Will you or daddy go with me? Can both of you go? No son, only one. Mama, what if I go to the hospital? Who will be there? What if I die? Will I be alone? As a nurse for 19 years, I resent the comment about being not educated. I have 19 years of nursing experience, 13 of those in pediatrics. I have my master's degree in nursing. However, I know this is not a one size fits all approach. I would love to see masks come highly recommended. I would love to see dances and activities continue to take place outdoors. My middle schooler attended a pep rally that was outside. She totally enjoyed it there were zero complaints. The common ground amongst all of us is that we love our kids. We want our kids in school, learning with their peers and being with the staff that is trained to educate those kids. Please consider highly recommending masks so that we can continue to keep our children and staff, staff safely in school. 
Thank you again. Next up, we have Allison Dunn. A couple of years ago, y'all spent over $100,000 to clean up Lori's logo mess. And then when it comes time to enforce it, y'all, each one of you voted not to enforce it. And lo and behold, here we are today. Father God, we invite you in this place and plead with you to show up in a mighty way. May your light outshine the darkness in this room and in this district. My prayer for each of you and all of you is this. May you care more about what God thinks of you than what your fellow board members think about you. May your responsible, responsibility to love and protect the children in this district and the schools in this district outweigh your political ambition. May your hunger for righteousness be stronger than your complacency and desire to keep the peace. May Jesus' love shine brightly in your home and in your heart. May you know in a very real way how wide, how tall, how very deep the love of Jesus is. May you find your voice and use it for the, for, for the glory of God in everything you do. Amen. Next up, Whitney Harper. Howdy. I'm Whitney Harper. I'm Dr. Harper's wife. So I will not be speaking to um, anything that is under his qualification, but about freedom and right to choose, which should be the uniting factor for all Americans. We are here for our freedoms and for our ability to make decisions for our children, for our families, and for our bodies. This is not something that should be left up to the educators. I am, both of my parents are educators. Both sets of my grandparents were educators. I know what it was like for them to be in the school system, how exhausted they were when they came home, simply by making sure that the children in their classes had the best education that they could possibly have. And putting a proper use of PPE on educators is unrealistic. That is not something that can be accomplished by someone whose job is to make sure that they are well-versed in English and essay writing. So I ask that you leave those decisions to the parents and you allow the educators to do what they went to school for and what they live for, really. They love the children. It can be, um, excuse me, It should be up to them to provide an ed education, to focus on lesson plan writing, to make sure that the kids get out of school safely and that does not require masks. And for anyone who would like to write this down, there are 25 studies um, proving masks as ineffective 
And that website would be medrxiv.org. If you look this up, you can actually follow through with what um, the non-mask wearers are interested in. And I hope that you are all interested in what they're interested in as well. So finally, I would like to bring back a sense of community that once defined Wimberley. And that is focusing on freedom and voluntary action. So everyone came together voluntarily to support one another and we can depend on this community to continue to do so. Thank you. Next up, Shannon Rigby. On September 10th, I was part of a group of concerned parents and community members who met with Mr. York, Mr. Brugman, and Mrs. Howard to discuss a list of requests that we organized and submitted to the WISD COVID task force. Sending our children back to school has been bittersweet. On one hand, we are so excited to have the doors open and our children learning in the classrooms alongside their friends where they belong. On the other hand, we were dismayed to see that most of the COVID safety protocols that were enacted last year had completely gone away. With the rise of the Delta strain wreaking havoc on our country and with our youngest community members still unable to be vaccinated, we felt like we were sending our children into certain disaster. As predicted, the case numbers in our schools have skyrocketed. We are thankful to Superintendent York for taking our concerns seriously and working with us to find small ways the schools can better protect our children. We look forward to the new COVID health and safety protocol changes being released. We are thankful to Mr. Brugman for his awesome work on the COVID dashboard. And we're thankful that this process has been one of respectful dialogue and the knowledge that we are all on the same side. We want our children to be in school, to be safe and to have access to the quality education that Wimberley is known for. This is a conversation that must continue. Even today, members of our group have informed us that they have withdrawn their children from WISD. They are concerned that changes are not happening quickly enough. Many of those who have withdrawn are students in the special education program who desperately need the resources that being in school daily allows. I hope that we can work together to find ways that allow these students to return to school to get the safe public education that the law guarantees them. I know that everyone on this board cares about the health and safety of the children and families in this district. We have different ideas of what that means and what it looks like in this unique era. I added this when I got here because I've been in Wimberley for over 30 years and I see so many faces here tonight who have been a beautiful part of my life. I see the woman who led my Bible study that I was a part of during my first miscarriage and her love and shared wisdom was a godsend to me. I see a woman with whom I was able to share my breast milk when her baby was in need. I see a woman whose sweet daughter was in my reading group when I volunteered in her third grade class. I see a woman who introduced me to Saturday Night Live and Paul Simon in high school. We are all connected. I hope that we can continue to have conversations guided by respect and compassion that allow us to demonstrate the true spirit of this community. Thank you for the work you do and thank you for allowing me to speak. Next up, Chad Kenine. Going last, I thought was a blessing, but everyone said everything I did. So I'll make an audible here. Uh, first, I just wanted to say thanks to Dwayne and Ken. Um, they headed the uh, COVID pro protocol got uh, the shack together along with the COVID task force team and also some parents like myself, we all sat in here. And I just wanted to give you some in insight of what came away from that. I mean, as we all see, there's definitely a difference between the two groups, but coming in, there was an equal number of both parties. We split up into a few groups. We had the opportunity to actually share our thoughts, write them up on pieces of paper, really discuss it. And everyone sort of let their guard down, at least it seemed to me, and really just share their true feelings about it and actually talk. And it made me go back to like junior high. I'm like, we're literally acting like we're in junior high again, but it worked. We all sat there. We all had good conversations. We respected one another. And at the end, 
it seemed to me, I don't know how everyone felt about it, but it seemed like we came up with some great ideas and some great red resolutions, which I think Dwayne's going to be going over today. And I just think we all need to get back to that. Like we've been hiding in so social media or going after people and no one faces talk to talk and like, I mean, face to face and actually talk about it. But the one I think sad thing about that coming after it is I just moved here four months ago. No one knows me. No one has my e e email. All of a sudden, boom, I started getting emails. I started, people started trying to bolt bowling me around on my views. And I'm like, I just moved here. And I'm like, what is happening? I was really shocked. But I want to say, I don't know who it is. I haven't even looked at the pe people, but if it is you, email me. Let's go to coffee. Let's have lunch. I'll buy. Let's talk about it. Don't hide behind your email and try to influence me and scare me into these tactics. And that, that was one thing I just wanted everyone just to remember that, you know, if you do disagree, let's just go back to the basics. What do you tell your children? Let's talk about it. Let's have a conversation. That's going to get us back to the point of us figuring out how to ha ha handle this. I'm at fault. I came from Cal California. I thought I was escaping where I was, but I see that there's a lot here. That's the exact same thing. And uh, I just want to get back to a point where we can have discussions and we can resolve issues in a way that we don't utilize fear, control, manipulation to get what people want. And that's what we don't need. So thank you. Appreciate it. Next up, Ivy Beck. Okay. Um, hello, I'm a freshman at the high school. And I just wanna say thank you for letting it be optional because I have loved seeing everyone's smiles in the hallways because it's been awesome. And um, yeah, thank you. Keep the award for the shortest comment of the evening, <laughs> which we all appreciate. Uh, next up, Lindsay Derringer. Wimberly ISD trustees, Superintendent York, and Wimberly friends, um, and I'm talking all of you. Um, I appreciate how the administration has been working with teachers, local medical professionals, staff, and parents to make a more detailed COVID plan for WISD. I look forward to hearing more about that this evening. Um, just this, this last weekend, we had two family friends pass away from COVID. One was unable to get into the hospital in time and the other fought for several weeks before losing the battle to the disease. These were not children. Um, I know a big part of, of the argument against having children mask and get vaccinated is that it doesn't affect them severely. However, even if our children are not hospitalized or dying, they are likely to spread the virus to family members and community members that are being hospitalized and dying. This is bigger than WISD. This is about Wimberley and Hayes County, even into other counties. We don't have a hospital here in town. So when people get sick here, they have to commute to other towns and counties to get care. That's exactly what happened to our family friend. There was not room in the ICU for him and he was unable to get the care he needed. Our decisions affect others. A word that summarizes my point is selfless. Don't we all strive to be selfless? Selfless in our marriages, with our children, and in our friendships? Where is the disconnect when it comes to selflessness and COVID? It's not about doing what's best for just your family. It's about doing what is best for our entire Wimberley family. I may vote differently than you. I may attend a different church. I may support a different organization. But let me tell you about the ways that we may be the same. I'm a mom. I'm a friend. I believe in God. I enjoy our beautiful town. I shop in the same stores. I have kids on the same sports teams as you guys do. And I love my kids just like you do. Those are just a few. 
I am not the enemy and neither are you. If we ever want to repair our community from this ridiculous divide that continues to grow, we have to be selfless. We have to be open to differing opinions and listen to professionals and not call each other enemy or ridiculous or laugh. I leave you with this, this quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Every man must decide whether he will walk in the light of creative altruism or in the darkness of destructive selfishness. Thank you board and administration for your time and service. Next up, Sarah Hossecker. Hossecker. Did I pronounce her name correctly? Sarah Hossecker. Hossecker. <clears throat> so look around. I see a lot of great faces. I was here last time and I spoke and I wanna thank y'all again for your support for freedom and what you're doing here in Wimberley. My family is a military family. We have moved all around the United States and overseas. And when we finished that, we came to Wimberley. We have five children. They are aged 19 to two. I have one at the high school, one at the junior high, one at Blue Hole, and one that will be at Blue Hole next year. So a lot of you have said everything <laughs> that I could say. I have my football players here. Where's our cheerleaders and our volleyball players? These kids need their freedom just like we do. <laughs> So I just want to speak tonight and pray that we can stay the course for our freedoms. Thank you all so much. Next up, Mindy Weber. Hi, y'all. It's me again. Um, I feel close to each and every one of you because, well, ex except for Joe, I, I am. I have history with everyone on this board. Um, Joe has become, along with many of you, my pen pal. I, I write frequently. I give you stats. I give you studies. I plea, I beg, I've told you my story. I've told you my family's story. And I know you care about my story. And I know you care about my family's story because our daughters have gone on mission trips together. You have helped my family intimately. I have prayed with some of your congregation in a way that we never thought possible because we believed and we shared and we listened. And that's what I'm asking us to do today. I keep hearing when, when Dwayne, when you wrote those, read that thing at the beginning, I wrote down the words kindness and respect because that is what I am asking for. I am asking us, for all of us, to show each other kindness and respect. I am not wearing this because I think it makes me look cute. I am wearing it because I have hereditary conditions that if you unknowingly and unintentionally get me sick, 
I will be one of those people in the hospital. I don't want to be. I want us to start having real conversations again. We are a small community. We know each other, we live near each other, and we have got to stop this and please listen to each other. I'm all about freedom, but with freedom comes responsibility. And I hope moving forward that we can sit down, have real conversations, and truly listen to each other. That's my ask. Thank y'all. And Lord knows I would not want to be sitting where you are sitting. And um, thank you. Next up, Janelle Hedrick. Hello. Um. My son has been lucky enough to be a student of WISD for the past three years. We are so grateful to the educators that work tirelessly to help our children learn and grow. Unfortunately, this year we were met with a difficult decision. Um, we had to look at what WISD was doing to help prevent spread, the spread of a rapidly spreading and mutating virus before we decided to enroll our son in school. Our son is not the typical student. Our son has autism. He receives occupational therapy and speech therapy that is allotted by the state through this public school system. His IEP consists of development in social settings and peer interaction. Sorry. The routine and social dynamics he receives from just being in a classroom has helped him thrive for the entirety of his enrollment. Sorry. Our son also has an autoimmune disease. We had to make a choice that was a lose-lose for us. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, looking at this year's COVID prevention honestly made our choice. We couldn't risk his health. Unfortunately, isolation from peers has resulted in regression. Um, the development of tics and anxiety. Oh, I don't expect WISD to enforce hazmat suits. <laughs> I'm not asking you to put bubble wrap on every kid. <laughs> but he deserves to receive his state approved therapies and his WISD collaborated IEP, which also um, with, while also being kept as healthy as possible. If it is all about the kids, then that means my kid too. Children with disabilities and health risks deserve visibility. They matter, my son matters. This is a difficult um, issue to navigate. I know you all do the best you can to make decisions that benefit all the students. I really hope that my son can benefit from the decisions you make. Um, thank you. Next up, Christy McCollum. I can talk to kids all day, but adults terrifies me. So I'm a science teacher, but no means an expert on COVID. But I do feel like an expert at children. I'm a mother of four. I've been teaching over 20 years. I've taught first grade all the way to math in a boys youth prison. I taught in Houston through hurricanes, and I was teaching first grade when 9-11 happened. But nothing affected kids like last year missing out on social interaction, and all of the things that get kids excited about school. I felt strongly about this for a year, but I was scared. I saw administrators and school board members who love children called murderers. I've seen my friends' businesses trashed because they spoke against masks. 
I was scared being a teacher my job would be affected. I thought I was the only one that wanted concerts and football games and hugs and all the things I missed. I felt like I had to sneak into the library to support the kids who pushed against masks. Then the day the mandate was lifted, all the teachers around me who had been shaming those kids took their masks off. That was terrible. But you know what? We weren't alone. We were just scared to speak up. When this year started, I didn't know what to expect. Would I be the only one not in a mask? Would parents not want their kids in my class because I don't wear one? What I found was for a year, I thought I was the minority, but we're not. I teach 120 kids, 16 wear a mask, two below their chin, six under their nose. So eight out of 120 that merit properly, including two of those children whose parents write the letters about masks and canceling pep rallies. Kids don't care. They don't care what each other does. They respect each other. If only we could do the same. At football games and volleyball and church, the numbers are lower. I care about kids, but I care about their mental health. The atmosphere in the school in my classroom is so different. Virtual schooling was not good for anyone, including myself. I'm also tired of the hypocrisy. Some of these very parents writing the letters I see in indoor spaces with no mask. I've seen staged photos where everyone is wearing a mask and a candid photo taken seconds later where no one is wearing a mask. That makes me sick to my stomach. We're doing this to these kids. I'm devastated for those who have experienced loss to COVID, but I'm devastated for those who have experienced loss due to depression and suicide from isolation and lack of social activity. These kids need dances and pep rallies and football games and all the things that make school and puberty easier to handle. I saw the devastation of my cheerleaders when their pep rally was moved. Their skit was canceled and their dance and their tumbling that they had worked on couldn't happen. Then they're all crammed at lunch and at volleyball and football unmasked and it's lunacy. I'm for hand washing for all, masks for those who want them, but we need the activities back to normal and back to normal in person. For mask and, van and vaccines need to be left to the students and their parents. Thank you for all you do. Next up, Blakely Dagenhart. My name is Blakely Dagenhart, and I'm here on behalf of the um, Wimberley Junior High cheerleaders and the Wimberley High School cheerleaders. Um, we often go unappreciated, and we are. A, really hardworking group of girls. We promote Texan pride, Texan spirit, and we stand in front of fans for hours yelling and cheering and try to get the crowd motivated to support whatever sport is going on behind us. We practice year round and we basically fund ourselves for the uniforms and camps. We are the face of the Texans in the games and many other functions all year. I'm asking you to not use pep rallies as a token of good faith in preventing the spread of COVID. Just to, appease, just to appease a few people. The pep rallies are the one of the few activities that truly unifies and honors all Wimberley Texans, from band to theater, UIL, competitions to sports. The pep rallies honor them all. Pep rallies are cheerleaders game day and volleyball and football have their game day. Pep rallies are ours. We ask that you please not use pep rallies as a political view um, to, to take away something that we enjoy doing. It is my senior year and I really, really wanna have these pep rallies. Um, so let us cheer and let the kids of WISD have their pep rallies. Thank you. Hey folks, uh, once again, thank you all for your comments. We are not able to re formally respond, but we definitely appreciate them and we've heard them. Uh, at this time, I ask that we take a 10 minute break and then we'll reconvene our meeting. Okay, welcome back everybody. We're gonna reconvene.
We're going to move down to item number four on our agenda, which is our consent agenda. We have a motion. Mr. President, I'd like to make a motion we uh, accept the consent agenda as written. Second. Motion a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Looks like that's unanimous. Can we see Will? See Will out there? It seems to be off all right. now. Motion passes. All right. Next item is uh, item five, which is our resolution. The nominee to serve on the Hayes Central Appraisal District Committee. And do we have a volunteer to do that? What does that person do? Uh, they're the representative for WISD <laughs> because we're a, a taxing jurisdiction. So we get to have um, our representative there yeah. to sit basically on the, on the board. Uh, I don't, I've never done it while well, I've been on the board, so I'm not sure what the time commitment oh, looks like. Needs. <clears throat> Monthly? Tracy. Uh, yeah. Tra yeah. Tracy. Will, you want to serve? Sounds like a good role for Will Conley. Will, are you, Will do you want to be the... You want to meet with the tax people once a month? Board sure, that, sure, that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> Okay. I'd like to make a motion that we have Will Conley on that uh, he's CAD task group if we need to make a motion. So we have a resolution and if Will's willing to do it, I think the board can sign that resolution. Oh, we have D. We just have D tonight. No, no, we don't have that Dottie. Dottie. Thank you, Will, for your service. Oh, you're uh, going to get out of stuff. Do we need to make a motion on this or? <laughs> I'll take it. Okay. All right. Well, in case uh, we've got a motion, do we have a second? I'll second. Ken, all in favor, raise your right. <laughs> Congratulations, Will, and thank you. All right. Well, thanks, guys. That's what you get for not coming to the meeting in person. <laughs> all right. Moving to item number six, which is our reports. Uh, first one is our health and safety report. And we have our SRO report, it's in our package. And the second one is the WISD health and safety update. I'm gonna turn this over to Mr. York. So uh, we formed a committee between the uh, SHAC, the uh, School Health Advisory Committee and the COVID task force team. And um, we, we've come to a consensus on a, what we're calling the COVID-19 student protocol. Uh, there were some changes made because of confusion uh, with the parent uh, notification of what is called a cluster, three or more in a, in a class, in a classroom. And so I want the public to know that um, I spent uh, a little bit of time with uh, Eric Snyder, the uh, health county uh, epidemiologist. And I simply asked him, I said, so if we have a cluster in a classroom, how do we keep kids in class? And how do we keep uh, school moving forward? He said, you've got two options. Option number one is that you quarantine teacher and all children. Uh, in that class to home, and then they would receive their assignments from home. The second option was to um, consider using mask for the teacher and the kids. And he's very aware that we're not a man, uh, mask mandate district. And so he said, in your case, what he would recommend is that if we wanted to keep them in school, those parents who did not want to mask their kids were hoping no more than three to five days, but we couldn't guarantee that given the 10 day quarantine, that um, <clears throat> that would be an option for them. However, however, if a parent does decide that they do not want their kids in a mask, 
then they would have an unexcused absent at home and then excused. excused. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I said unexcused. Oh my gosh, retract, retract, retract. Excused, I'm gonna say that again, excused absence. And then their teachers would uh, make sure that they get the work that they're missing. Um, and so here's how we change this protocol. Oh, I can't even believe I said unexcused. So um, it, it's written here about the health department and you're gonna be shared this document once we've uh, finalized it. And so we, we state the two options, uh, mask or not mandated. Let me make sure that I am covering everything. It is a recommendation to, to quarantine your student. The length of quarantine period has two options, 10 days. Students that are symptom free and have not had and not had a negative COVID test re result, that is the 10 day quarantine, seven days. Students who are symptom free and have received a negative COVID test result that has that was administered on day five or later of their quarantine period. And then we finish by saying if your student is fully vaccinated uh, with no symptoms, there is no need to quarantine, but it is recommended to be tested for COVID three to five days after last exposure and to wear a mask covering indoors for 14 days. And so that, that has been the, the, the biggest area of, um, that we felt like that we needed to come to a, a, a consensus on. And then I just wanna ask the board because the um, task force and SHAC has pretty well approved everything on here except for those exceptions. Is there anything else that you would like for us to, to revisit before we make this a final document? Just to be clear, we don't need board approval on No, this. you don't. Kind of I'm just asking us. your opinion. Seeking and input from us. Dwayne, can you just kind of talk a little bit about how um, teachers would get the daily work provided to students who opt to stay home? So we, we all know what, what challenges we had with remote learning. Those challenges exist no matter whether we uh, provide it or not, because we found out that it wasn't 90% of our kids that could receive remote. It was in the 70 percentile, because when you stream a lesson, they have to have enough bandwidth to keep a computer going. And we found that, that that's not the case in the, in the Wembley Valley. And so therefore assignments would be packet, paper, instructional um, material. It would not be remote. And to even set up remote in a quick situation like that where you have two or just three days maybe uh, that the, the entire class would have to be quarantined. By the time you set it up, the teacher would be rushing to develop lessons for that remote. The time frame would then have lapsed. Okay, so in, I don't want to talk about remote, but is it possible yes. to scan the lessons in and email them or make it easy, make it a better way so the parent doesn't have to come here to the school? Is that possible? I don't know. So, so you've asked a good question. So I need to sit down with the ad, admin team. And so we'll probably have a meeting tomorrow, admin team, and we will come up with an answer to that because I think it's a good, it's a good question and we need to provide that. It seems a lot easier for everybody to me. You just sure. shoot it out one time in an email, then you don't have to wait for parents to come. Pick and I think that, and yeah. That, so. And I think that uh, teachers would be uh, okay with emailing okay. in that case. Okay. I have a question about outdoor lunches. You told me on the phone that that was being offered already. So just anyway, like just for. So. Um, it just says only level two, so I'm just curious why. All right, so in our, in our thing at level two, when we get to point level two, 
but kids have always had the option to eat outside and we've encouraged that. Okay, so they do currently have that right now. So at the high school, I know they do. At the junior high, I know that Mr. Howard was working to make sure that that was available. In fact, being on his campus a couple of weeks ago, he was coming from outside with kids. So I know that that is definitely an option at the secondary level. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Dwayne, one thing that might make this document more profound when the parents receive it, guardians, grandparents, is I'm under daily screening. Uh, it looks like that, COVID-19 student protocols, daily screening. If your student has experienced any of these, any of these symptoms, please, it might be good to bold that, do not send or cap that. You see where I am there? Sure. Okay, maybe Ken or Dwayne, between the two of you could, I'm sure we have other members out in the audience that we could just bold that. Yes. Um, make it very, very clear. And also the word if in the next bullet point, students that experience these symptoms may return to school if. And you know, it's getting down the weeds, but it does stand out, it does make an impact. Um, and we, we did say, Dwayne, that you, emphatically said excuse absences to correct that yes and then test days are also excused correct absolutely yeah. if, if and it's then we have parent is notified of a positive case in their students class first bullet point is parents are notified of a positive covid case within their students class via email i think ken you just brought that up well the problem in our district and forgive me if I wasn't listening well, because I was jotting down some notes over here. The problem with our district is not all households have that capability in the internet. So can we also add their text, email or text? Because certainly we have mobile numbers for our parents. Does that make well, sense? I'd also like to make it paper available. I mean, if you, if yeah. that's the only way you can do it, you can come here and pick the paper up as well. But I mean, yeah. however we can get it to the parents uh, is what we need to do and not just depend on parents that drive here to the school. Cause our whole point is to not have people coming to the school if there's stuff. Happening. <clears throat> right. Yes. And so we're testing a system to notify secondary parents right now, as we speak, um, the first test uh, that we sent out today, that was via, um, was that Skyward or what? Th that was Skyward. And um, so, so we're looking at several options. We want to have the most effective option in place uh, to notify, but understand that at the secondary level, it's much more difficult than pre-K through uh, five. In that if a student is part of a classroom that has a cluster, then we have to notify every single student or every single parent that that child will be in contact with during the day. That could be up to 120 emails. And so if as a parent, you're getting an email that says that you, you know, your child is, is uh, in a classroom with someone who's been exposed or someone who has tested positive, they're gonna start calling and asking several questions. And I hope that everyone understands that through uh, HIPAA and FERPA, we cannot disclose names, we cannot disclose a lot of information. And so we're, we're working very diligently to, to find out a solution for this. And we hope that by the end of the week that we will have that. In, in the meeting that you were in, this uh, combined meeting, with uh, Shaq and COVID task group did, was there any discussion on a kiddo that has already had, a student that has already had uh, COVID and antibodies and returning to school? Was there any discussion on that? We did not discuss that in that no. particular meeting, no. And so there's a follow-up meeting, right? Yes, I mean, so when we get this document to a point where it is, um, ready to go live, which we need this to occur as soon as possible. 
Um, we will either convene the combined SHAC and COVID task force, um, especially if there's anything major. I would be contacting um, Marnie Moore and probably Dr. Pruitt to, you know, kind of review some of the changes, the last minute changes and, and let them know what they are. And then we would decide whether or not we would convene that joint meeting. Uh, I do, I will say this, working jointly with Shaq was very, very productive. And, um, and our parents also. Yes, and our parents. Our parents had some, uh, some good um, uh, comments and um, it was a very respectful meeting, which I really do appreciate. And so um, I'm hoping that if there's any major changes that we will get back together and make those changes. Uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll try to navigate that via email. Uh, but um, yeah, we're prepared to come back together. And so with those minor edits, um, I think it's a good document. Alan, do, did you, do you put these together? Okay. Uh, thank you. You do excellent uh, yes, he does. layout work and it's Very easy to understand visually. your work on that immensely. So Dwayne, I had a parent contact me and ask about the mask in the classroom. So we're, I just want to reiterate yes. that that comes from our epidemiologist, is that correct? So we have two options. Yes. We have the option to send teacher and class home, and then it's all generated through, you know, the teacher sending, emailing, however, assignments to the, uh, to the kids. And then the second is that we would have the option for the teacher to be in the classroom with a mask and the kids be in the classroom with a mask for that period of time. Reiterate though, you're not mandating masks. No, we're not mandating. With an all. excused absence to keep their child. Absolutely, it would be up to the uh, parent to make that decision for their child. Okay, and that's three or more in a classroom. It's three or more, it's called a cluster. Um, you know, terminology changes every day when you're dealing with the CDC and everybody else. So um, cluster was a new term to me about two months ago, and um, I learned what a cluster was. Why are you laughing, Roz? <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got. Thank you for that, Rob. I, I like that idea of bold and bolding those letters. So it makes it much nicer. So. Yeah, great. Well, continue to please keep us updated on on these protocols as as they become finalized and with any changes. Can I go back to the SRO report real quick? Yes, sir. There was some um, like some major change in this is did something happen at school that I mean I mean no I know you can't talk specifics but I mean the numbers increased quite a bit so I was just curious if uh, if we just started reporting different or if something actually changed or so I am at the SRO report this is the format that they started using last year yeah and um, so they began reporting um, in fiscal year 21. So once you find that column and then you can see at which campus um, these occurred. Yeah, I get it. I just, I mean, okay. we, we went up 100 calls in one year. So I'm just curious. FY, I mean, uh, everything 21. else is. 102, 135, oh, you're talking 50, about, 253, so, okay. yes, yeah. yes, is that yeah. quite a, is that point. last school year, though, right, FY21? Big thing is really, I need, yes, I know, I see it. So, would that be, yes, yeah, so, 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 that's last year, administrative investigation, um, that total 12, that really bumped that number up. Um, well, next year it says 100, and that's for the, the year 2021. Yeah, for the okay. year 2021. 
Okay. It's not 21, 22. And, and, and I will let them know that they need to clarify this, okay? Because I see where you're, um, I'm having a difficult time even, well, 21, August 21 is 12. So yes, we need to break this into school year and then that will be easier to follow. I mean, it's okay. just such a gigant, enormous yeah. increase that I was just curious. If does, anybody, does anybody know what that category? Uh, Assistant Administrative Investigation. I'm not sure what that is. Roz, Roz clear us up on this, please. Is that a real number? Good. That's good. I mean, probably, sorry. you're probably going to see a few more of, of those um, reports. And I'll be honest with you, I haven't seen Ronnie's report mm -hmm. to see how he broke it down. Um, but if I could, then I could probably explain it. Okay. Just a well, that's bit. great. But I, know I mean, we've to been me, investigating it just, a lot more. We, we it just a, means you're paying a lot more attention, and I appreciate that. So. Yeah, Deputy Young's back there. I don't, I don't want to put him on the spot, but if he wants. Yeah. <laughs> yes, oh, okay. he's he's oh, head of the SR host. So. Well, fortuitous that you're here. The, um, that assist admin can range all kinds of things. There's a lot of things that admin will come up with. They've got two two students that have a disagreement or something, and maybe there's some indication of maybe there was some violence or maybe not or whatever. So we'll get involved with that and we'll assist them with whatever we're doing. So those are kind of, it's kind of a catch all with stuff we're helping them with. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily criminal offenses that we're doing with. Um, so that, that number can fluctuate quite a bit depending on the call volume at the schools. But okay. If you don't have any other questions about any of the other categories, you can, I can try to help you with it. That was the one that kind of jumped out. That's really helpful information. We yeah, appreciate I didn't it. want to just whatever you let want. it slide. And to be clear, that column that says FY21 is really data for last school year that ended. 20, so I, I send those every month. So yes, but get them every we have month. 2022 yeah. totals now, which we're not even in 2022. So that's yeah. why I think yeah. the way we're we are looking at our data is maybe a little bit. Okay, yeah, I guess I don't. Total. Maybe all, we're looking at a different sheet. Or yeah, something. so this might be 2021. Is that how you read that? That was yeah, all, exactly. all of last year's yeah, school year, 2021. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Right. All right. So that part looks like maybe Dottie had done that or somebody had added those, those previous totals. Yeah. That's what that looks like. Ours doesn't go out that far. I just give you guys the current month. Oh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Great. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you for your time, James. We, we appreciate your help on that, Deputy Young. Thank you for being here this evening as well. Okay. That concludes our health and safety report section. And the next item is our CFO's report. And I know we have um, Mr. Moises Santiago with us, and I'll turn it over to him. Good afternoon. Uh, this is to present the financial report for the month of August. And this is to close out the fiscal year uh, 2021. So um, at the end of uh, the August month, we ended up with a total cash and investments of 16.9 million, of which uh, general fund makes uh, 68%, equivalent to 11.4 million, and the debt service 20%, uh, 3.4 million. Our um, unaudited estimated uh, general fund balance is currently at 9.1 million. Uh, we are still paying uh, prior year invoices and uh, of which we received uh, just recently or last week, uh, the SRO invoices, which are about 139,000. So uh, we would probably, um, you can reduce that from the 9.1 million 
um, calculated fund balance. So we might be putting back into fund balance about 160, 50,000, somewhere in there, at that figure. So um, in the in the general uh, total revenues collected for the month in the general fund, uh, 27.6 million, we collected 101.73%. Uh, and we spent 27.3 uh, million, equivalent to 97.8%. In the nutrition program, uh, we uh, collected uh, 740,000 in revenues, which is 101.05%. And we spent 862, uh, 1,769. Uh, we ended up the program, the nutrition program, with a minor um, deficit, which we are going to have to subsidize with partial funds from the general fund. That's how the nutrition program usually works whenever you are at a deficit due to your meal, meal participation. So the general fund has to subsidize that uh, deficit portion. Uh, this well, current you. year, before you move I'm sorry. forward, yes. Do you guys mind? I'm sorry. Yes. I mean, we're doing free meals for everybody. That's that... what I was going to do right now. Yeah, okay. that's what okay. I was going to say right now. Okay. Yes. This current year, uh, for the entire year, this is the very first time that the uh, USDA allows for every school district in the entire state of Texas to um, issue or give uh, free meals for um, all the students and uh, under the SSO program the uh, summer, uh, summer Seamless Operating uh, Program. Um, the reason why we are doing that is because the reimbursement rate is a lot more higher than our regular program. So uh, we already saw an impact on that and you will see it on the next month's revenues on this program. So that's a, that's a pretty good um, reimbursement rate that we're getting there. Even though meal participation has already increased significantly um, just uh, last month, we were already at, um, in the 10 days that we operated, we were already at 13,430 meals, um, of which uh, 2006 were breakfast and 10,000 uh, for lunch in just in a 10 day period. So I'm looking at about uh, 24 to 25,000 meals served during the month of current September month. So um, that's real good, real good. On the debt service, uh, we uh, collected uh, 6.8 million, about 100.5% uh, of the budget of revenue. We spent, uh, for, or we paid in debt service 5.7 um, million. And in the capital projects, we spent 2.5 million and we have a carry forward balance to this current year of 1.1 million. Uh, still, uh, during the entire uh, year, we generated almost 50,000 in interest revenue uh, for additional projects. So in the, let's see, in the proprietary funds, we have uh, collected revenues in the Blue Hole After School Program, the Jacobs Well, and the tuition base by um, 82,000, 82,494, 47,000. 332,000 respectively. And on the expense, we expended um, 83,000, 46,000, and 325,000 on those programs respectively. So we ended up with a um, overall profit um, of 7,120. Our collections uh, for the month of August, um, let's see, uh, we collected uh, for the month about 132,000 representing about 0.44 of the levy. And uh, the total levy we collected 100.66%, uh, <clears throat> whereas the previous year we collected 99.49%. So we actually collected 1.17 uh, uh, above the prior year. That's, uh, that's good. Um, since we resumed uh, transportation services uh, during the month, we uh, transported uh, 2,751 student riders in the morning and 5,121 in the afternoon routes. And um, we are averaging about uh, 275 students in the morning and 512 in the afternoon routes. We currently have 14 morning routes and 14 afternoon routes. That's the financials for the month of August. See if you all have any questions. They look great. I think we started out the year pretty good and ended up the year pretty good too.
I had a question sure. <clears throat> in regard to the food service. Yes. Uh, you know, it's wonderful that we're serving that many meals. Yes. And have so many kids participating. Mm -hmm. It kind of happened somewhat suddenly. It seems like that all of a sudden we're serving all these meals. Are we adequately staffed in, in food service to be able to handle that workload? I mean, are, are, are we doing okay? I guess another question. Yeah. Well, I've, I've, had, I've had several discussions with Heather, and um, she has told me that everything's working great. And that, um, you know, we're continuing to serve food, and she doesn't see the need. Uh, I told her at any point that she felt like we needed to increase the mm -hmm. staffing. Uh, definitely be open. Yeah. We actually kept, um, kept the same staff um, pre-COVID or pre-pandemic. So the staff we had be before the pandemic is the same staff we have right now. We are going back to our normal um, numbers that we were serving before. So we actually have the same number of staff. We never um, uh, reduced the staff at that department. So we have enough to cover. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Matt, ask one more quick question. Are we, do we have enough bus drivers and everything? I hear all these districts complaining about bus drivers. So. Yeah, so I mean, every single time we get an applicant, I guarantee you we interview that applicant <laughs> yeah. to make sure that we can either make them a monitor or um, it is, it's just taking almost 90 days to go through the process of just getting a bus driver tested in a bus. I mean, it. Um, Back in the coaching days, guys, what was it, three days, we had a bus driver's license, and uh, now that's extended to 90 days. Well, it's probably worth it. There's a lot of lives at stake on that bus. So. There are. There are. If I'm interpreting the data right, it looks like our fund balance is just a tad over 9 mil. Mm -hmm. if, yes. It's uh, actually on your page. Um, page three at the bottom. Page three, yes. That's the uh, balance sheet. And then you have your income statement, your revenues to expenditures on page. Um, two. Or your balance sheet is on page two and your uh, revenues and expenditures is on page three. Thank you can you. see that on the uh, third to the last column right there on the right. Questions? Thank you very much for your report this evening. More. Oh, yes, go ahead. Okay. So this one you actually didn't receive, and this is the last quarter of your investments for the current okay. fiscal year. Okay. Um, although I did send those to you, I do not know why you all did not receive them. Um, but this is the last quarter of our investments. Um, since we are at the end of the fiscal year, we kind of have to um, look into short-term investments so that we can get our funding since we have a longer period from now until we begin to see that revenue to come in. So I had to bring in more money into our pool so that we can liquidate uh, as we need um, every every month. Um, so for this uh, quarter, uh, we our investments uh, daily average balance was 24.3 million, uh, which is a decrease of 20% uh, um, from the previous year. Uh, like I said, uh, I had to draw down on those funds and bring them into the pool so that we can have uh, quicker access to those funds. Um, our earnings uh, during this quarter were only 7,626 at an average rate of return of 0.12, uh, uh, which is the previous uh, year, uh, previous quarter. So um, it's not too good, um, but hopefully um, as, the Fed, uh, as the Federal Reserve is looking into increasing potentially interest rates, uh, hopefully in the, in the near term, we'll begin to see more opportunities in those other uh, investment um, securities that can yield us a little bit more, um, more, uh, more yield, but still maintain the same um, uh, objective of liquidity and safety uh, for our, our overall portfolio. So uh, that's kind of our a summary of the investments for this this um, this quarter. This quarter investment report. Yes. Any questions? And our market value is seventeen point one million, and our book value is seventeen point one equivalent. So, okay. Thank you. Welcome. Next item on our agenda is our superintendent's report. So the majority of of my report um, uh, 
was given all the work that we've done with the COVID-19 uh, student protocols. But I do also want you to know that our teachers are diligently working to assess uh, achievement gap. Uh, we've started benchmarking across the board. Uh, I think that, that in some cases we're, we're seeing where we're a little more behind than we possibly thought we were, uh, but we're, we're making big strides to, to move forward. Tomorrow, we're gonna have an interesting meeting with a, a group from Region 18 that has some funding available for our teachers for, a, uh, for math uh, professional development. We're very interested in listening to what they have to say and um, hopefully implementing this, uh, this program. Uh, a part of this program pays uh, some of our teachers $500 on top of allowing them to do some professional development. Uh, Dee and I feel, feel like that we need to uh, visit with these people first before we take them to the principals. Uh, but you know, any opportunity that we can get to, uh, to get free professional development on top of and get the uh, supplying uh, additional income to our teachers is very positive. So I'm looking forward to that meeting. But our number one goal, once again, is achievement gap, assessing where that's at, individualizing instruction, seeing who needs intervention, who, you know, who possibly can be, um, you know, accelerated instruction within the classroom. And just remember, pre-K through five, we do a lot of small group, a lot of small group. It's very, very productive. And um, so I just, I know that our teachers are going to rise to this challenge. I really do. I have full confidence in it. Thank you. All right. The next report is the board president's report. Uh, we have a agenda calendar that's in the packet just for review. Uh, show some upcoming agenda items and some of our upcoming meetings. And then secondly, just an update on the general election timeline. We have an election coming up on November second 2021 for places one two and three and early voting begins uh in person on october 18th through october 29th uh, election day november 2nd and the canvassing of the election will take place on november 5th uh, through the 15th uh, one date during that time period For my report this evening. Uh, at this time, we're going to move into closed session. Uh, before doing so, we're going to take about a 10 minute break. But let me read this before we break. The, more, the board may adjourn into closed session pursuant to Texas Government Code Section 551.071. The board may then re enter into open session for further discussion and necessary action. Deliberation and closed session may include security devices or security audits, Texas Government Code, Section 551.076 and 551.089. Personnel matters, Texas Government Code, Section 551.074, including, but not limited to, new hires, terminations, employee discipline. Deliberation regarding real property, Texas Government Code, Section 551.072. Consultation with our attorney, Texas Government Code, Section 551.071. The time is 8.12, and we're going to break into closed session. Okay, coming at a closed session, back into open. Do we have any action? I've got it right here. So uh, <clears throat> I'd like to make a motion that we accept the appointment of Tracy April Greer, the first grade teacher. We just hire people for the, yes. for the district. We don't. I'd like to make a motion that we hire Tracy April Greer for the district. 
Yes, there you go. There you go. Motion. Do we have a second? Second. And I'd like to make a motion that we uh, hire Betty Parma for WISD. Second. Okay. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Looks like that's unanimous. And we have to do one more board action there to accept the resignation okay. of two teachers also. I don't have it. Okay. Pass it down to you. It was on a second page. Oh, I'm not on. Uh, move that we accept the resignation of Christine Ledestro and Catherine Sparkman. Second. Motion, second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. Motion to adjourn. Adjourned.